Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. In today's video I'm going to be talking about all the books that I read in the first half of September. Wow, so far September has been a great reading month in terms of how many things I've gotten through. It's been pretty high volume, although part of that is a vlog that I did. I'll link it up above if you haven't seen it yet, where I did a challenge for 24 hours to see how many novellas and short pieces of fiction I could finish in 24 hours. The answer is seven, in case you're curious, but I talk about all of the things that I read there. So I have so far this month read 21 things, which is a lot. Like that's definitely a much higher number than usual. We'll see how the second half of the month goes. I will say it's been a little bit of a mixed bag. Some things I have liked a lot, some things have been a little more of a miss, and we're going to get into all of it. If you are new to my mid-month wrap-ups, the way that these work is I will talk about the books that I read in the order that I read them. At the end of the month, I do my whole big wrap-up from lowest rated to highest rated with all my stats, but for the purposes of this video, I'm just going to talk about books in chronological order, and I will begin with my DNF. I had one DNF this month, and then we'll get into the 21 books that I finished. My one DNF I'm actually quite bummed about. It was a book that I was very highly anticipating. It sounded like something I would love, and unfortunately an execution just wasn't working for me. I had an e-arc of this from NetGalley. It is The Makeup Test by Jenny L. Howe. So this was pitched as kind of a enemies to lovers in academia with a plus size heroine, all of which sounded excellent, totally sounded up my alley. I ended up DNFing this at the 32% mark because I... I, I just knew this was not going to work for me. I really disliked both of the characters, and we were pretty much in the head of our heroine. She's supposed to be a PhD student, and her ex-boyfriend is like an academic rival who has ended up in the same PhD program, and they're competing for the time of this advisor. I just found both of the characters really unlikable. I didn't buy the romance and based on reviews I was seeing I don't think it was going to get better for me which is why I ended up just deciding to go ahead and DNF it. I also found some of the details of the conflict in, in the academic world to be fairly unbelievable. So yeah, unfortunately this just wasn't for me, which I'm bummed about because I love the idea of having more plus size heroines out there in romances. I, this, it just, this wasn't, this wasn't the one for me. So I ended up doing nothing. Yet. The first book that I finished reading was Zachary Ying and the Dragon Emperor by Shiran J. Zhao. I didn't necessarily love it, but I liked it pretty well. I will say middle grade is a little hit and miss for me. This feels very much like your middle grade sci fantasy adventure story. So if that is what you're looking for, it's what you're going to get. I like what this book is doing in terms of bringing Chinese history to the forefront. It's centering a Chinese American boy, and it's got some light sci fi elements to it with like video games, VR video games intersect with spirits from Chinese past who are inhabiting people and it's like a whole is a whole thing and he's trying to save his mom. I will say for my kids this was a little too scary. I tried reading it out loud to them. I ended up just finishing it on my own. Both of them, their eight and five, were like, no, this is too scary when his mom was getting taken away. So I was like, okay, maybe eventually. So, you know, use judgment depending on how old your children are and whether whether it will work out. I did end up liking it. I will say it ends on a cliffhanger, so we don't get total resolution to the plot. It's very action-packed. I think I tend to prefer middle grade that takes a little bit more time with the characters and the relationships. This one is very high action, but I think for some readers and some children, this is going to be great and exactly what they want. It moves along really quickly. It is very driven by the action. Personally, I adored Iron Widow, which is this author's debut YA novel. This one, like, I liked. I gave it three and a half stars. Not a new favorite for me, but I appreciate that it exists and what it's doing. Also, you have some low-key gay representation. It's not a big focal point, but we do know that Zachary Ying is not interested in girls romantically, so that is on the page, but again, not not a big part of the story. Then I read the first Vampire Academy book by Rochelle Mead. I had thought I'd never read these because I knew I had read a spinoff series, but upon reading this I realized I did in fact read this first book. It was a reread, and now I remember why I didn't keep going with the series, even though I liked the spinoff. I do not think this holds up. 
very well, to be honest. I read it because we're planning on doing a podcast episode about the show, and I wanted to read at least the first book before watching the new Peacock show and kind of refresh myself on what the deal was exactly. Uh, yeah, there's, there's, it's very much a product of its time. There's some really questionable age gaps here. I just, I was cringing through this whole thing because there were all these moments that I think were supposed to be romantic or sexy or whatever between our, you know, 16, 17 year old protagonist and this 25 year old man in a position of power over her. And I was just like, oh, oh no, no, I can't, I can't. So uh, I really hope that the show does a better job with this. Based on the previews, I think maybe they're going to do a better job with some of the more questionable elements of the original. I think the casting looks great. I'm excited to see what they're going to do with it. So if you want to hear our thoughts on the show versus the book, tune into Chapter 3 Podcast because we are going to be discussing it. It should be interesting. I ended up giving this two stars. I will say it's very compulsively readable, so easy to read. The world is fun. I can see why this was such a big hit, but I also see why I definitely preferred the spin-off series with slightly older characters who were more mature and it didn't have some of the same same things. So, yeah. I don't know how well this holds up. Then I read Up Against It by Laura J. Mixon. This was sent to me by Tor. It's part of their new Tor Essentials line where they're doing new prints of uh, SFF books that they think have been important to the genre. And I'm really glad that I got this because I had never heard of it and probably wouldn't have picked it up if I hadn't been sent this. Up Against It is science fiction. It was published in 2011. And what's interesting about this is that there's an introduction by James S.A. Corey and they talk about how this book came out the same year as Leviathan Wakes and they feel very similar. I think if you like The Expanse, the show or the book, you should definitely go and check this out. But it's interesting to get a woman writing something like that, that kind of surviving in space in colonies with political issues and AI issues and kind of a variety of things and lots of different characters. It's really interesting. It kept me riveted and interested throughout. My one caveat with this is that if you are really sensitive to portrayals of various gender identities, just know that this isn't isn't great. I mean, it came out in 2011. There are people on page who are gender fluid and they're part of a particular group of people. I don't know that the way they're depicted is great but it's not a huge part of the book and otherwise I had a really good time with this. I gave this book four stars and I think it's worth picking up. Then I read Nothing More to Tell by Karen M. McManus. This one I had as an advanced reader copy from NetGalley and it was fine. I feel like I feel like I was disappointed because the marketing for this book was really pushing this sort of dark academia aesthetic. The idea that this was going to be like, you know, elite private school, dark academia, and it it's it's not. It, this, this is very much in line with other things that Karen M. McManus has written in the past, so if you're going into this hoping for that kind of a vibe, you are going to be disappointed. That said, if you like what Karen M. McManus does, which is she writes these more intense YA contemporary novels with murder mystery plot engines, then you're probably going to have a pretty good time with it. I, I think it is competently done for what it is, not my favorite thing. I gave it three stars. I just think it did not meet my expectations of what I was hoping for, but it was okay. This one is set at a private school following two characters there who had been friends when they were in eighth grade and their favorite teacher was murdered. And now the girl is back in school for the first time in a few years and working as an intern for a true crime podcast, trying to uncover what really happened. But you know, of course things are messy. So three stars for it. I think this is very much in line with what she typically does for that kind of YA mystery. And if you like that, you'll like this. If you, like me, were going into this hoping for something with a little more gothic vibes, dark academia vibes, yeah, it's not, it's not really given any of that. So 
three stars. Then I read Lucky Girl by M. Rickert, and I am actually going to talk a little bit more about this in a forthcoming vlog, so I'm not going to get into it too much detail here, but it is a horror novella that I had for review from NetGalley, and it was interesting. It wasn't necessarily what I expected. I feel like maybe this needed to be a little bit longer. I have some thoughts on it, but if you were looking for a quick horror read around the holidays. It is partly a Krampus story and it follows a set of characters over a series of years who reconnect with each other. I don't want to say too much more than that. I ended up giving this one three and a half stars. I liked it, but I didn't quite love it, and I will be talking more about it in a forthcoming video. Next up, I read A Little Hatred by Joe Abercrombie. This is part of the series read-along that myself and Liana at Liana's Library are doing over on Chapter 3 Podcast. This is the first book in the newest First Law trilogy from Joe Abercrombie, and it was excellent. It was excellent. It was funny, dark humor, but, but funny. I loved a lot of the characters. Savine is everything. Um, probably my new favorite character in Abercrombie's work. And yeah, it's just, it was really enjoyable. It was really smart. His writing is amazing at this point in his career. And uh, yeah, I mostly had really good things to say about it. I'm curious to see where the rest of the series is going to take us. I gave this four and a half stars and rounded up to five. It's, it's like right on the cusp there. Maybe I should have given it a five. I, I'm not sure I'm quite quite to a five, but I'm very close, so hence the four and a half. So yeah, really enjoyed this, very much looking forward to continuing on with this trilogy. And if you want to hear more in-depth thoughts about this, stay tuned for a podcast episode. Then I finally finished reading Consider the Octopus by Nora Rowley Baskin and Gabe Hollisner. This was sent for review from the publisher a while back, and I'd been slowly kind of reading it to my kids. We kind of lost lost steam and I finally was like, we just need to get through this, guys. This is going to be our bedtime read for a while. It was fine. I like the project of this more than I think I like the execution of it. I like that it's a middle grade book about conservation. It's talking about the ocean and the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It follows two kids who are sort of trying to save it and a girl who sneaks aboard a research ship. Like, the believability factor not high. You you really have to just kind of like let go of any believability, which is fine. The structure of the book is a little strange because it starts at a certain point, then goes back in time, then comes back to where we began and goes forward. And it's all right. I liked it. I think my kids thought it was also okay. I gave this three stars realistically maybe it's more of like a two and a half but I really like the premise I like what it's trying to do and also the focus on having female scientists because I'm all for girls getting more into STEM so for this age group especially I think that's great it was fine if you have kids who are really into conservation and the ocean and stuff like that maybe give it a look but I wouldn't expect anything earth shattering and I wish it had spent a little more time on the science conservation piece of it and a little less on the antics, but that's me. Then I listened to Nothing But Blackened Teeth by Cassandra Ka. This is a horror novella in the Japanese tradition, and I enjoyed it. It's kind of a haunted house story, so it follows a pretty diverse group of friends who travel together searching out haunted places, and they are in this haunted house in Japan because two of them want to get married there which maybe was a dumb idea, as we quickly come to realize. I liked this. I think it's interesting. The writing is really beautiful and lyrical. I would for sure read more from this author in the future. I do wish it were a little bit longer. It, it is a fairly short novella, and I feel like it could have done with a little bit more building out the relationships between the characters before bad things start happening but I liked it. I gave it four stars. Next up, I read a book that I have a physical copy of, but uh, this cover version is an NSFW one, so I think I might actually just pop up the, <laughs> the, regular, the regular cover for most of my review. But uh, this is Office Hours by Katrina Jackson, and uh, this is the original beautiful cover. So I liked a lot about this. It is an erotic romance set at a university following two professors, one of whom is a Latinx man who has tenure, and one of whom is a Black woman who is working on getting tenure. 
and uh, it is very, very sexy. So if you are someone who likes very high heat, who would prefer to have more intimate moments than other plot points, this is going to give you what you're looking for. Personally, I wanted a little bit more on page from the relationship. I feel like a lot of the moments of moving the relationship forward and conversations happened off page. I do think though that she gives a good sense of time passing and of that developing even though it's not what we're spending the bulk of the page time doing. The thing that I really liked about this though is the way that it depicts being in academia, especially for women and for people of color and women of color, and the pressures of that. It talks about adjunct faculty, it talks about the pressures of getting tenure, it talks about uh, people of color being pushed to be on diversity committees and mentor other students and all of these different things that I think are really big factors. And the author in her day job is a professor, and I think that's really obvious. It's clear that she knows the space intimately. For anyone who doesn't know, my spouse is a professor and so I'm also fairly familiar with a lot of this. So I thought that that was just done really well. And for me, that definitely bumped up my rating. I, I liked it. It's very sexy. But for me, I did want a little more time developing that romance. But that is really going to be a personal thing. Some people, this might be exactly what you're looking for. And I think a lot about it is great. I gave it three and a half stars and rounded up to four on Goodreads. So maybe go check it out. Then I read The It Girl by Ruth Ware. I feel like this has been a uh, polarizing book, which is interesting. A lot of people have compared it to In My Dreams I Hold a Knife. I can see the comparison. I am maybe in the minority that far preferred this to In My Dreams I Hold a Knife. That book I didn't end up liking very much, but I really liked this. And for whatever reason, Ruth Ware generally really works for me. I like her writing. Her characters often work for me in ways that other writers in the genre don't. And I think that's really a personal thing. She's sort of a polarizing author. I feel like people like her or don't or are picky about which books of hers they like. I generally have enjoyed everything I've read from her. This is not one of my favorite books from her, but I did enjoy it. Now, what I like about Ruth Ware is her characterization and is the fact that usually, in addition to whatever the sort of murder mystery piece is, she also will have other things she's exploring, other topics that she is dealing with. And that, to me, is often what really elevates this above something else. It is also, however, the thing that I think really annoys some readers because they think her books are too long. They're like, come on, it's not fast paced enough. It's spending too much time on these boring details. Those boring details are what I love about her books. And I think this is a great example of, of why some of those books are polarizing. What I think this book does really well is number one, it does a great job of depicting what it is like to be a pregnant person. And I, I, I think that is done excellently. Um, the other thing that I like about this is the way it viscerally depicts what it is like to be a woman being harassed in subtle ways by a man and feeling sort of gaslit about your own response to it and brushing it off and trying to act like it doesn't really matter. I think that is also depicted really well in here and the, the internal complexity and struggle of that. I liked that. The murder mystery itself, not super shocking, which for me is fine because you know what? I'm not reading this book because I want a shocking twist. I'm reading it because I like the way that she does characterization. I like the journey to get there. I like the way she unpacks these character choices and I had a good time with it. I gave it four stars. Again, not my favorite book from her, but one that I quite enjoyed. Also, man, my uh, my haunted ring light is out in full force today, and I should show you. I got a couple pieces of the new merch for myself. I got this really cozy sweatshirt, and I I kind of love it. I, I want it to cool down so I can actually wear it. But uh, y'all asked for it. There is haunted ring light merch, so if you're if you're interested, it's there. I feel like this is gonna be such a long video because I had so much that I read this month. 
Uh, what is next? Before I run out of battery. The next thing that I read, I had an audio review copy from NetGalley. This was The Sunbearer Trials by Aiden Thomas. And this was so good, y'all. So good. I have really enjoyed Aiden Thomas's previous books, but I think that his writing just keeps leveling up. And this is exactly what I'm wanting from a YA fantasy story. It feels very firmly YA. It definitely feels like it's written for teenagers. The way that it handles trans and non-binary identities, the way that it handles Latinx culture and history and heritage is incredible. It deals sensitively with difficult issues like different kinds of parental abuse, verbal and physical. It is also a lot of fun. It's action-packed, but does a good job of still having strong characterization and great relationships. It, like, this was great. This gave me everything that I wanted from it, and I am so excited to see where book two goes and to continue to read from Aiden Thomas, because I feel like his writing just keeps getting better. And I'm so pleased for him because it debuted on the New York Times bestseller list, and it absolutely deserves it. It's a gorgeous book. So this is set in a fantasy version of uh, Latin America, <laughs> I guess. It kind of is drawing on multiple different cultures and, and places in its depictions, but it follows a semidios, a demigod, who is from the sort of less prestigious category of semidioses. He is a jade and not a gold, and normally only golds are the ones who are heroes and they undergo training and they do the sun bearer trials. But our main character, who is a trans boy, unexpectedly ends up getting chosen by their god to be in the sun bearer trials. There are content warnings for this, so check those out if you need them, but I loved this. I gave it five stars absolutely worth the read. It was great. Then I read Prime Meridian by Sylvia Moreno Garcia. This is one of two books that I still wanted to read before I do my guide to reading Sylvia Moreno Garcia, which some of you have asked for, so that is coming later this month. I'm excited for it. But this is a novella that is uh, light sci-fi and literary fiction, I would say, is kind of the vibes of it. I loved it. I think this novella gives you a really good taste of what Sylvia Moreno Garcia does in her writing. And it is not going to be for everyone, and I think that's okay. Her books tend to be more literary in the sense that her stories are more concerned with ideas and characters than they are about plot. Like there is plot, but what carries the story and what she is clearly most interested in is ideas and characters. And they're all deeply rooted in Mexican history and culture, and this is no different. So this is a slightly futuristic book following a young woman living in Mexico City, living in poverty, kind of making ends meet as a rent-a-friend, basically. And she dreams of going to Mars. There are colonies on Mars, and Mars is her dream of escape. And this also plays with the ways that film can give us a means of escape and depict something that maybe isn't the same as the reality of that thing. I loved it. I love her writing so much. I gave this five stars. It was excellent. But I think if you want a taste of kind of what she does and her writing style, I think th this might not be a bad place to start and try it. But more details on different places you could start with her and which books might work for you coming in this upcoming guide video. Had to change the battery, but now we are going to get into the novellas that I read for that 24-hour reading challenge that I mentioned. And so because I talk more about all of these in that video, I'm not going to get into too much detail here. I'm just going to kind of more briefly go over them. There were seven novellas that I read during that time. The first was Galatea by Madeline Miller. This is a short story inspired by the Greek myth of Pygmalion. It is a feminist retelling and I liked it a lot. I gave it five stars. This was short but definitely packed a punch. Then I read The Night of the Mannequins by Stephen Graham Jones. This is a horror novella that uh, was not what I thought it was going to be. It went in a direction I didn't expect. Hard to talk too much about without spoilers. I liked it, but it's not my favorite thing from Stephen Graham Jones. It is basically about a group of teenagers who uh, do a prank 
involving a mannequin that maybe comes to life and it is a slasher horror novella, I ended up giving it three stars. Then I read Exodus 23 by Freitas Moon. So this is religious monster erotica by a trans non-binary author with a trans main character. And while this wasn't entirely my cup of tea, I did like a lot of things about it and I liked the deeper messaging behind what the author was doing here. Heads up though, if you are very religious, very Catholic, you might be really uncomfortable with some of the things in this book. So if you want to hear more, I do have Goodreads review for this novella and I also talk more about it in that video I did. Next I read Recitatif by Toni Morrison. This was my first time actually reading from Toni Morrison and when I am emotionally prepared to I clearly need to read more because this was brilliantly executed. This one I had as an influencer review copy from Libro.fm. Thank you so much to them. If you're interested in checking them out, I have a link down below. They offer audiobooks, but their proceeds go to support your local indie bookstore, which I think is amazing. I really like them as a company and do support them. This is interesting though because it is the only short story Toni Morrison ever wrote, and it is preceded by an introduction read by Zadie Smith, and her introduction is the same length as the novella, if that tells you anything anything about it. It is this brilliantly executed novella that is basically doing a thought experiment on readers. It follows two women who meet as girls and then reconnect throughout their lives. One is black, one is white, and their racial identity is central to the story, but we are never told which is which. It's great. It's so well done. They should teach it in schools, 100%. Five stars. I don't know what else I would give this. Then I read The Heartbeat of a Million Dreams by Halo Scott. This is an indie published sci fantasy with a sapphic romantic subplot, and I ended up liking it. One thing I'm going to say about this, though, is go into it expecting it to almost read like a novel in verse, especially one of our two character perspectives. It took me a while to adjust to that, but it reads more like poetry than prose. And I think if that is something that appeals to you, you might get on well with this. I might recommend this for fans of This Is How You Lose the Time War by Amal El Motar and Max Gladstone. If you liked that novella, you might get on really well with this. I feel like it would probably have some crossover appeal. Not entirely what I tend to be looking for in this subgenre, but there's a lot I like about it. I also really like the way that this handles neurodiversity. One of our main characters is neurodivergent. I don't know if she's intended to be autistic or have some kind of sensory processing disorder or something like that, but that is depicted really powerfully on page. So if that is a thing that you were looking for, you're going to find that here. It is queer. Uh, yeah, I liked it. I gave it three and a half stars and rounded up to four in Goodreads. Thank you to the author for sending me a copy for review. Then I I read Even Though I Knew the End by C.L. Polk. This is a novella coming out in November. I had an e-arc on NetGalley and I really enjoyed this. This is lesbian fantasy noir. It's got paranormal murdery things happening and it is set in 1930s Chicago and has all the vibes. So if that sounds like something you would like, definitely give it a try. I gave it four stars. The final novella that I read for that video was Into the Riverlands by Nevo. I really enjoyed this. It is the third installment in the Singing Hills cycle. Personally, this is probably my least favorite of the three, but I did still really enjoy it. It was still a four star read. I just love Nevo's writing. I love getting to revisit Cleric Chi and continue to learn more stories. I like how this talks about that ugly women and women who aren't beautiful are often left out of tales, and this kind of seeks to correct that. It was great. Four stars. And then since the end of that video I have finished two more books, so let's talk about those before we wrap this up. First up, I finished an e-arc of Witchful Thinking by Celestine Martin. This comes out in late September and it was delightful. I <laughs> really enjoyed it. What's unfortunate is that a lot of the reviews are fairly negative on Goodreads and I can't help but think that maybe this is just a matter of expectations not lining up. This this is a cozy small town romance with witchy vibes. It is not action packed. It is not high angst. It is very just like cozy hangout and we have a witch and a merman. It's got black love. It's 
it, like it, it's delightful. It's got complicated female friendships, just a little bit of magic, somewhat of a slower burn kind of childhood friends to lovers story where he is back in town and you know he's scared of settling down and she is trying to get out of the rut and do things that scare her. It was great. I feel like this is exactly the, the vibe if you want a cozy fall read to cuddle up with. If you enjoy things like like legends and lattes like if that is your vibe definitely go and read this it's great if you did not like legends and lattes because you thought it didn't have enough plot and it was too slow and boring and didn't have enough angst then you know this might not be your cup of tea but I thought it was great so I gave it four and a half stars and I desperately want more books in the series because there's lots of interesting side characters and I want to see them get their HEAs as well the final book that I read in the first half of September I will be talking about in greater detail in early October when we do a live show for this read-along over on Mel's channel. So I'll have her linked down below. Me and Mel and Kara from A Wild Book Garden are doing a read-along of the Graceling series. And so I read Fire by Kristen Kishore. This was good. I am very excited about our discussion and I'm also glad that I knew a little bit about what this book was before going in because I feel like you could be a little blindsided if you don't know. This book came out in 2009 and it is a incisive critique of rape culture and victim blaming you know, not the things that were as much in the cultural conversation at the time. And given some of the early reviews of this book, I'm not sure that everybody fully understands that that, what, that is what this book is doing. Like, that is the project of this book. The project of this book is to critique rape culture. And I kind of think it's brilliant at doing that. I think as a fantasy novel, I didn't find it as enjoyable as Graceling. I think the pacing is a lot slower and a little more uneven. It spends a lot more time with the characters and court politics and a lot less on the action. So I can see why there are some people who found it a little bit boring, perhaps. But I really liked it a lot. I gave it four stars. I think it's very smart. It's doing a lot of important work. And it's not spoon feeding it to you. I would also say that this doesn't read like what you would expect from YA. It's quite mature in the the themes and the topics it's exploring, the way it's exploring them, the ages even of the characters. It, it's it's kind of in that nebulous, like we maybe we would call this new adult now, but I, I thought it was great. So at this point, I would say this is a four star read for me. Maybe after our discussion, I might feel like I should bump it up. But right now I'm giving it four stars because as a novel, I wasn't as invested in it, in the characters and in the plot as I was with Graceling. But I just love what this book is doing and the way it's doing it. So look forward to that conversation. Whew. So there you go. <laughs> It's a lot. Those are the 21 things that I read in the first half of September. How much will I read in the second half? I don't know. Probably not nearly this much because I'm not going to be trying as hard to read a lot of this. And I will say I read a lot of very short things that are like 100 pages or less. So that is that is part of it. But it's been a good reading month so far and it's amazing how much more reading I can get done now that my children are back in school. It's uh it's exciting. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything I talked about in this video. And for your question of the day, why don't we talk about whether you find yourself to be a more character driven reader or a more plot driven reader? What what is it that really draws you into a book? And maybe it depends on the book, maybe it depends on the genre. But are you somebody where yes, if I love the character, let me spend all the time with them, I don't need the plot to really move very quickly? Or are you somebody where you're like, nah, I need that action, I need it to move forward, I can't just be sitting here, why are we sitting here talking about the characters? Let me know in the comments down below. If you like this video, it does help if you give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.